At this point in the day, we've heard several examples of collaboration by design, unlikely partners coming together in new and innovative ways, and hopefully by now you're starting to believe that collaboration has a potentially larger role to play in your own life, that of your family, your business, or your community. And Patrick and I believe that collaboration, if done correctly, can be the key to overcoming some of life's greatest challenges, some of which we'll outline in our talk. But it is the contention of our talk that the success of any collaboration that you engage in starts with you. Collaboration is about working together. Collaboration by design is simply about working together better. And I'm sure you'll agree that many of life's activities are better done together than alone. Let's have a look at a few examples. Tennis, this guy played alone, still lost. <laughs> Hugging is definitely something that's better together, but choose your partner wisely. <laughs> and teeter-totter is a lot more downs than ups if you don't have a partner. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. No, really, trust me, close your eyes. I want you to think, about some of the collaborations in your own life. First, let's start at home. If you live with anybody, you already collaborate to create a household. Is that collaboration as fruitful and enjoyable as you'd like? Think about work, projects you do inside the office, collaborations you do with other partners. Are they as efficient and effective as you want them to be? Now think about the community. What we do in the community quite often is in collaboration. Is that as fruitful as it could be? Now, open your eyes and think back across the things that were just inside your mind. The common denominator is you. But it's not about just being there. Showing up isn't always enough. Look at these two. <coughs> what a plan. You tell your mom, two o'clock, we'll meet at the park. I'll tell my mom, two o'clock, we'll be there. We'll teeter-totter together. Not quite the outcome that they were looking for. But these are kids. Surely, professionals do it better. Fortunately for many of us, our collaborative mistakes aren't this visible. But again, I think this highlights the point that collaboration, it takes careful planning, it takes design. So how do we set ourselves up for this kind of success to take place? Well, again, it's our belief that it all really begins with you. So today, on the TEDx Makatawa stage, we have a new product launch. It's an amazing new software, and you're just going to love it. It's going to take your collaborations to the next level. You have heard and used the iPad. You have played on or listened to the iPod today. We give you the U-Pad. <laughs> Steve Jobs got a much better response than that. What the UPAD is, is an acronym for a software system you can plug into your own brain. And it's the concept in your next collaboration of changing your perspective, challenging your assumptions, and moving from fear-based to opportunity-based decision-making. So the first condition of UPAD is to change your perspective, because as we know, life looks different depending on your vantage point. I think that's why it's so important as individuals that we do and try new things that stretch our understanding and view of the world. And when it comes to collaboration, perspective is equally as important. I find that far too often we head down a path before we ask questions like, do we really have the end user's input? Do we have the voice of the customer? Or have we consulted the parties ultimately responsible for implementing whatever it is that we're creating? So regardless of the size of the magnitude of the collaborations you're involved in, one of the first questions to ask up front is, what are the perspectives needed? And make sure they're represented at the table. The second condition follows closely behind the first because it's often our perception of the world that helps shape the assumptions we make about the way things work. And in large part, assumptions can serve us well, but they can also be detrimental to our success. In fact, some highly respected and intelligent people have been making bad assumptions throughout history. Fortunately for us, they vocalized them. Maybe you've seen a few of these quotes. There's countless others out there like them. And again, it, when it comes to collaboration, it's on us. It starts with us challenging our own assumptions about the other individuals in the group, but then also as a group, being willing to ask, what assumptions are we making about this product, this service, or this idea, and are they founded? The third condition of UPAD is moving from fear-based to opportunity-based decision-making. 
When we show up to a meeting or a collaboration or a project, we make a lot of decisions. And in business, we make decisions every day. But when we show up from a fear-based perspective, we hold on to what we showed up with. And we're scared of things like being put in charge of something, not being put in charge of something, sharing your knowledge, sharing your resources, sharing your client base. You're scared of the competition that might come from that. So we hold on so tightly that when we get out of the other end of the collaboration, we quite often have what we started with because we held on to it so tightly we weren't able to grow. Robert Frost knew a thing or two about decision-making. His classic poem, The Road Less Traveled, talks about which path do I take. But I think the last verse in his poem really spoke to that he was an opportunity-based decision-maker. And he said, I should be telling this with a sigh, ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. So to summarize, before we go deeper into this UPAD software, it's about you changing your perspective, challenging your assumptions, and moving from fear-based to opportunity-based decision-making. Now, Patrick and I, we work together a lot in community development, so we are in collaborations, large and small, on a weekly, if not a daily basis. And when we started to put this chat together, we said, well, would this really work in something as big as maybe education or poverty? or health. So we looked at that. And we're first going to look at the health area, and we're going to talk about perspective. Now, we spend, in the United States, $3 trillion a year on healthcare, number one spender in the world. But a recent Time magazine study showed we were 12th of 13 of modern countries that were surveyed and researched. Number one in spending, second to last in outcomes. And we think that might be because our perspective is on spending that money on sick care. In fact, we spend about $10,000 per person in America on health care. But we really think that what we're doing is looking at it from a consumerism perspective. Can we give them a pill? Can we give them a test? Can we bring them back in for more tests later? Can we do something that's going to fix them after they get sick? And it's very expensive to do that. What would our community look like? What would your personal health look like? if we took that $10,000 and said, let's invest this in the wellness of yourself and your community, do you think we'd still be second to last in outcomes? I don't think so. Let's look at assumptions in healthcare. This is a personal example. I recently had the opportunity to work in challenging the assumption of a local emergency room. Now, their assumption was pretty sound. They want to get people in and out of the emergency room as quickly as humanly possible. Who agrees with that? I am in for that. Don't let me stay there too long. But they have a certain population in the emergency room called frequent flyers. And a frequent flyer is somebody who shows up six or seven times. They don't get miles for it, but they show up six or seven times a year for things that you might think are not normal, emergency room stuff. It's not a broken arm or a car crash. It's other issues in their life that when they weren't well taken care of, they didn't show up. Things like not having a primary care physician, not having a great... A, uh, option for food, not having access to all of the things that keep us healthy, and they show up in the emergency room. So the assumption of this emergency room I was working with said, well, these people cost us money, let's get them out even faster. How do we speed up this process? But through the discussion, we found out that it's all the things happening outside the ER that keep them coming back and back and back. So instead of speeding the process up, what if we slowed it down? What if we spent four times longer with this person in the emergency room, with this frequent flyer, so we can actually bring the things that they need, the resources they need alongside their bed, a social services crash cart, so to speak. And they did that, they piloted it last fall, and it's worked amazingly well. By spending the time up front, they've increased the quality of care. It's longer, but they've increased the quality of care. And it came because they drastically changed their assumption. They could have just gone on and said, let's do it faster and faster and faster. But they would have seen them more often and more often and more often. So the last piece of the UPAD that we looked at for health was decision making. And this was another project that we've actually both had a chance to work on. And it's called the Community Health Needs Assessment. Our United Way in our community does a health needs assessment every three years. And then about four years ago, a law came down that said hospitals had to do them as well if they were nonprofits. We have three in our community, three nonprofit hospitals, and they were all going to do their own community health needs assessment. So we called them up and said, get together, this will be so much fun. <laughs> yeah. 
I couldn't believe it. They got in the room, and it was like stony face, and they were not really talking. Well, from their perspective, their fear-based decision-making was, I don't want to share my data with this other hospital. I don't want to lose my clients to this other hospital. I don't want to share my very best ideas or, or let them know that my ideas aren't that good. There was a lot of reasons why they would approach that from a fear perspective. But after a couple of weeks, we saw them put their hats aside and look at the opportunity. And now, as you can see on the screen there, that's the cover of the 2012 assessment. No logos, done together, drastically improving outcomes in their community. And they're right now in the process of finishing the second round of 2015. All because they moved from fear-based to opportunity-based decision-making. And every one of those hospital administrators, even though they probably wouldn't, would have the right to say, I should be telling this with a sigh, ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. So how might the UPAD methodology apply to something like poverty? And before I dive into this, I want to be very clear. Patrick and I aren't up here pretending to have the answers or the solutions to something this serious. Merely it's our goal that we would provide a fresh way of thinking about something like poverty so that we can craft better solutions in the future. So the first condition is to change our perspective. And there's a perspective that I hear often as it pertains to workers that are living at or above poverty. And it goes something like this, that many times these workers are unmotivated or they don't show up to work on time or even at all, or don't show initiative in the workplace. And from the perspective of an employer, those challenges are very real and very understandable. The success of their business depends on the success of their employees. But as we as a community seek to tackle things like poverty reduction or even talent development, it's critically important that we have all the necessary perspectives at the table, like that of the employee. Now, I bet many of us understand that many low-income low wage earners oftentimes need government benefits to help make ends meet. But I bet few of us grasp the concept that even the slightest increase in some of their wages can trigger a loss in those benefits overnight. For example, 50 cent an hour raise could mean $60 more a month in take-home pay. That could be offset by hundreds of dollars lost for things like childcare and food stamps. We have a name for this. We call it the cliff effect. And in our current system, there is no scale down of benefits. They simply disappear. So put yourself in one of these workers' shoes. What incentive do I have to show initiative in the workplace when this is a reality that I face, when my family's already just trying to survive? Again, the employer's perspective on this matter isn't wrong, but neither is this employee's. And my fear is that until we have both perspectives at the table, we aren't going to come up with the best solutions. In order to illustrate how we challenge our assumptions as it relates to poverty, I'm going to start by, by sharing a bad S word, so I, I apologize in advance to the crowd. And yes, that word is subsidy, and I'm going to make it look even a little worse. I'm going to throw the word government in front of it. Now, if you're being honest, I bet for at least a few of you, when you hear government subsidy or you read it on the screen, maybe it just makes you, it just doesn't hit your ear right. Maybe it makes you cringe a little bit. And there's reason for that. Through media, politics, literature, we're largely taught that subsidies are a bad thing, particularly for individuals and especially in the long run. Well, let me challenge our assumptions on this. April's right around the corner. It's tax season. I'm sure many of you are like me. You're getting ready to file. Maybe you've done so already. How many of us are planning on taking the mortgage interest deduction? Property tax deduction? No, I am. Maybe you have a son or daughter in college, or you're in college yourself. Maybe you're going to take the tuition expense deduction that's allowed. Whether we like to admit it or not, every one of those things is a financial support used to promote economic or social policy. It's the definition of a subsidy. Now, we can rationalize in our minds why a subsidy is, is good for someone and, and not someone else, or, or why I'm more deserving of being able to claim these than somebody else. But at the end of the day, we're talking about subsidies. Now, let me pause. I'm not up here saying subsidies are the solution to poverty that we've, we've just been missing all along. That's not my point at all. My point in this illustration is that if we inherently have a negative assumption about what a subsidy really is and the role that it, that it plays in sustaining a family and sustaining a community, we bring that assumption with us to the solution-making table. And again, it's my fear that until we start to challenge our own thinking on matters such as this, we will not come up with the best solutions. Lastly, how do we move from fear-based, opportunity-based decision-making as it relates to poverty? 
Well, let's highlight Ottawa County for a moment, just here in West Michigan. We have just above 3% unemployment. Individuals who are struggling have access to government benefits. We have over 1,600 registered nonprofits to fill in the gaps, many of which focus on human services. Being a strong faith-based community, over 400 of those nonprofits happen to be churches, many that have service-based ministries and thousands of volunteers. And we also happen to be the second most philanthropic region in the entire country here in West Michigan. Yet with all of those support systems and all of those re resources, the trend lines when it comes to poverty and poverty-related issues is heading in the wrong direction. The siloed approach hasn't worked. Now, I believe collaboration is the solution, but we need to begin to collaborate differently. You see, the way it currently works is we're very willing in this community to talk to one another, come to the table, share our ideas, our knowledge, our experiences, even our data, but all while protecting and holding on to what is ours, our current way of operating status quo. Very often, we end up just creating something new. That's acting out of fear. We need to begin to act with an opportunity mindset. And what that looks like is coming to the table, willing to question how we use our resources and reallocate if necessary, to restructure programming based on best practices, to be willing to ask the question, whose responsi responsibility is it ultimately to help lift individuals out of poverty? And I'm not just talking nonprofit and government here, I'm talking business and healthcare and education as well. Because let me tell you, the opportunity is bright. We know that reversing the trends on poverty will lead to a stronger workforce, more educated students, and healthier citizens. It's time we changed how we make decisions in this community. And it does start with you. So in closing, let's look at UPAD. Let's plug UPAD into our brains for our next collaboration. Change your perspective, challenge your assumption, move from fear-based to opportunity-based decision-making. Because you can hire the best facilitator in the world. You can purchase the best software there is and implement world-class models on collaborative work. But at the end of the day, it's you sitting in that chair. And if you can plug UPAD on top of those tools, there is nothing you can't do. Thank you. Thank you.